Good evening, everyone. So today, Lung Pi would like to share with you about the idea of the right view, which I haven't had a chance to actually share with you during the past three, four weeks. And I think this is very important because the right view is number one on top of the list in the Noble Eightfold Path. <laughs> That's the starting point. Right view and right thinking, these two factors of the Eightfold Path, they are grouped in the heading of the wisdom. So when we talk about wisdom in Buddhism, we may be thinking of the, the, the first two of the Noble Eightfold Path, which is right view and the right thinking. Because right thinking will follow the right view. You need to develop right view first. And with the view you have, then you can think toward that direction. Let's say you have view toward the um, drinking, dancing, entertaining. This is good, no problem. So if you will accept those kind of behavior or activity, then your view thinking, your thinking will tend to be following that view. Okay, it's okay to, to drink, to dance, to sexual misconduct. The way you think like that, because you, that's how you see the world. But if you view differently, you see that, oh, that path is not good. It take my life down the road to suffering. So I shouldn't be involved with smoking, drinking, or gambling. So when you will seeing the world like that, so you will not involve with those activities. You see, the will is a starting point. And today I'm going to take you back to one sutra, that how the Buddha to be, before he become the Buddha, how he see the world. And this is the starting point of the right view. And I believe all the Buddhist monks, all the people in the world should reflect on this deeply of how we should see the will. What would, I'm sorry, how we should see the world. What would be the right view to see in things in this cycle of existence? This is another beautiful sutra. As the moment, in this very moment as we sit here, We are facing a lot of problems and, and challenges in the whole world. In the past few years, the world has been struggling with pandemic of the COVID-19. It's still not ended. And recently, we start noticing that there's another virus, you know, start spreading again. What is it? Uh, I don't know the name, but it's on the news already. So it, it, this, is, this is the nature of things. It's suffering. So the pandemic of the COVID-19, and last year, uh, I think this year we noticed that you know, Russia started invading Ukraine, and people have a lot of stress, uh, uh, a lot of political issues, violence and war everywhere, including on top of the, uh, the problem that we already have, such as the, um, the global warming, climate change. And this thing is uncontrollable at the moment. It's suffering everywhere. And the Buddha mentioned about this long time ago, how he see things that there is no safe place in this world. Wherever you are, whoever you are, there is no safe place for you to be free from suffering. It's impossible. Suffering is the greatest danger of mankind. Wherever you go, whoever you are, you cannot escape the realm of suffering. So if you imagine yourself, you're standing on this planet Earth, and underneath the ground that you're standing, there is a low frequency of earthquake all the time, 24-7. So you cannot stay still, firmly, safely, wherever you go, even in the house, in the car, at home, at work. It's keep on checking underneath the Earth. It's a low frequency of earthquake. This is impermanent. This is uncertainty that we cannot escape. The Buddha feel like when he noticing that people kill people, there was a war back then, you know, even his family also have fight. Many times that the Buddha have to be a middleman to stop the war from the family. From his very own eye, people kill people. People take advantage from people. The rich take advantage from poor, poor, take advantage from poor. That's, that's how people live in the past, and that's, this is still exists in today, in the 21st century. Same thing, same thing. 
And the Buddha to be reflect on that. This is how he see the Buddha. He, he compared to the fish in the very small water area, in the very shallow. The fish cannot go far. And wherever he goes, he don't feel safe. He can be catch from the fishman, you know, or someone can step on that shallow water and he die. There's no place for the fish that he can feel safe. The Buddha to be reflect on this and he was very really unhappy. His mind was lost, his mind was empty. There's no refuse, there's no, no place that's safe on the planet. So he seek to find the solution. He seek to find something called deadless. How many people you know in your life <laughs> would think of five solutions like this? To fight with death, sickness? <laughs> Buddha to be happy want to be one of a kind. So he see this is a problem and I, I hope that I can find a solution for this. It's not only myself suffering, people around me are suffering. He sees something deeper. And he asks permission from his mom and dad, you know, I'm going to go to the jungle and find the solution to death. What is the deadless stage? That we, is there anything like that? So if I find it, then I will come back and share with the world. So when I first encountered this sutra, I feel like, well, is it possible for a human being to think like this? Something that unconceivable. How can we find the way out of death? And you know what? When I come to the teaching of the Master Nun, <laughs> and that changed the way I see things. At the young age, when her dad passed away, and she didn't have a chance, she didn't have a chance to ask for forgiveness. She was very upset. And she set her goal, you know what, one day, I will find my way to seek for forgiveness from my deceased father, dad who passed away, at the young age. This is the example that I see after reading the sutra, and I come to Kunjai's story, wow, there are some people who are thinking like that. They are, very, they are a very rare group of people. For regular people, human beings like us, we don't think of something like this, who fight with death, sickness, you know, and mental liberation, because we don't have the right view. They have been developed the right view for a countless of lifetime. So this is how the Buddha sees the world. It's unsafe, unsecure, wherever we go, impermanent will come and get you. In Ukraine, in Norway, in New York, Turkey, wherever you're from, including this place where you feel peace and calm, quiet, conducive for meditation, we're still standing on top of that frequency of impermanent. Every single moment. And the Buddha see that. He see the problem and he wants to find a solution. And that is why he gives us a warning. You guys, all of us, we, we get shot by the arrow into our heart the day we born. We don't know when it starts happening, but we got shot by the arrow, the arrow of lust, arrow of hatred, arrow of delusion, arrow of wrong view. It's in here. It's still in here with us. And we don't know how to remove it. We don't even know it's here. If we don't know it's here, then we don't find a way to remove it. And the Buddha to be noticed this problem, and he wants to find a way to remove this problem. He don't know how to do it, but he feels like something is bothering him. This has to be a solution. For this, this is, the, this is a serious problem for mankind. And how come people don't, don't aware of this, don't notice this problem? But he see it, and he wants to find a solution for this problem. And here we go. He achieved enlightenment, and he shared with us this wisdom. So every time I get back to the teaching of the Buddha, I feel so fortunate to be born in this lifetime and have access to this kind of wisdom. It's very rare teaching, very rare wisdom that we can find in any books in the whole world that teach us about this nature of life, this phenomena about suffering. So if we don't have the right view, it's difficult for us to live good life. But when you go to the text to see what it means by the right view, 
you may come across the list at least ten things that may be difficult to relate that to. For example, right view means you fully understand the Four Noble Truth. Well, what is the Four Noble Truth? How can I relate it to that? The Four Noble Truth is huge. It's the heart and soul of the teaching of the Buddha. And we don't see it. We can read it, but it doesn't mean we understand it. You must be fully understood the Four Noble Truth, and that is called the right view. And another example is, right view is about seeing, understanding the concept of rebirth, understanding of the law of karma. There, there was a previous life, and there is a future life. This is not the first lifetime that you born, and it is definitely not the last lifetime either. And when someone see this, this is the right view according to the teaching of the Buddha. <laughs> How can we relate it to it? How can you relate it to this? Have you died before? I don't know. <laughs> but we know that we will be dead in the future. We don't know when, but we die for sure. But is there anything after that, after we die? We don't know. And how come the Buddha said, seeing things like this about the law of karma, about the future rebirth, this is called the right view. If someone don't see this phenomena as it is, this is the wrong view. Because if, we, if someone don't believe in the law of karma, someone don't believe in the future life, then there is no point for you to do good or to do bad. It doesn't count. You can steal, you can break all the precepts because there is no future life. What's the point of observing precepts? Let's enjoy stealing stuff. Let's enjoy having sexual misconduct. And when your view is like that, that's how you behave yourself. And that's why every person in the world is full, including Thailand, the land of Buddhism. So there's no safe place. This is one example of, of right and wrong view, according to the text. But when you read by yourself, you may get confused. It's hard for you to believe. How can I believe future life? Because I don't see it. Even this moment, do you really believe life after death? Because none of you, including myself, we have no ability to verify it at this very moment. But that's what it said in the text. What would be the practical reason for us to look at the right view according to the Buddha teaching so we can put into practice right away? So I would say right view is your ability to be able to see the deepest cause, what caused you happy or what caused suffering to your life. Because if you see this, that means you understand the nature of thing, what caused you happy, what caused you unhappy. Normal human being, we wouldn't do something that caused us suffering, right? That would be silly. We would do whatever it takes, whatever it costs us to be happy. We would go to that direction, not the other one. And this is the right view in general. At the same time, you need to understand the concept of precept, right? To be a virtuous person, observe precept, meditation, and develop the wisdom. This is also the right view because with all of this in place, with all of this in place, you observe precept, you practice meditation, and you develop your wisdom. It helps you to see things the way they are. It helps you to understand what it means by the right view much better. Right view is the view that leads you to be a virtuous person, to, to live good life. You will not harm yourself. You will not harm others. You will be more loving kindness, more compassion. There would be no war, no violence, no taking advantage from each other because you understand the root cause of happiness and the root cause of suffering to yourself and to others. And this is the idea of precept. Precept is not about not breaking them, but it's about understanding them to maintain your the, the, the nature, the, the normal state of, of human, not to go around and kill people, stealing stuff, sexual misconduct. And this is the right view, yes. You will become precept, precept become you. It will be an auto precept, auto sati, auto sampachanya, auto concentration. When you see things, you're not going to do bad things. 
that become auto autopilot laziness being on time being polite it become autopilot this is the idea of precept precept is not just rule precept is including the manner the attitude to be able to teach yourself to come back to the state of peace and calm mind to control the nice manner in all situation that's about precept not just oh i'm not breaking any precept today i'm a good person you may not be a good person you may a selfish person <laughs> You not care about what's happening. I don't help do dishes. I'm not gonna fix, do the show. I'm I'm just gonna meditate. This is that person not fully understand the concept of precept. And again, it's about the right view toward precept, right? Precept is about unity of the group as well. When people do things, then we supposed to help. Then we go help, not just avoid killing, avoid stealing. No, we go beyond that already. We can't do this thing. We're not gonna, as a monk, forget about this, right? Killing, killing what? <laughs> Stealing. Is there anything for us to steal? You wear the same clothes as me. <laughs> you know, we have the same stuff. You know, <laughs> what's the point of, of stealing stuff from your friend? It's not, doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Sexual misconduct. Forget about it. False speech, maybe here and there, because you're not concentrate. You know, drinking alcohol is impossible. We don't have it here. So. By default, you know, five precept is already there. Precept is not just that. You have to understand it much deeper than that. Why five? Why ten precept? Why eight precept? Why two hundred precept? Why three hundred precept? You have to see the whole picture, the whole idea of precept. And again, this is the right view. Without having the right view, you cannot find peace and happiness for the rest of your life. Right view is the starting point of wholesomeness, of goodness into life. Oppositely, having wrong will is the starting point of suffering for the rest of your life. If you see alcohol, gambling is good for the rest of your life, you go deep down to that road, the road of suffering. But if you see the opposite, you know, from this moment on, even though you have to go home, this road, but you see that this is not good. Gambling, alcohol, um, lying, stealing stuff is not good for the rest of your life from this day onward. You will not do it. And you will not support anybody. You love to do this, and this is the right view, and this is the starting point of having good life. Not only in this lifetime, you will be protected for the future lifetime. In case there is something called the life after death, if there is no such thing, then so what? You can be happy, worry-free for the rest of your life because for the rest of your life because you don't break precept. But if there is a life after death, that's even better. Because you have accumulated a lot of merit, you don't break any precept. So if heaven exists, then you probably go to heaven. But if you don't have this accumulated before you die, and you keep on doing the wrong, walking on the wrong path, and then welcome to the hell realms, then if if hell exists, so just think about it. Super important to develop the right view. So I have one story to share with you. It's a beautiful story of one of the two of the greatest uh, disciple of the Buddha. About having the right view. You may heard the name of Sariputta and Mokkalana. These two great disciples. I would say you must know them. <laughs> you must know them. Okay. If you don't, make sure you know them. These two great disciples. You see their name throughout the text, most of the sutra. Let me give you a little bit of background because it's such a beautiful story. In the uh, Rajakru kingdom. In India time, during the Buddha time, there were two villages. The village named uh, Kolita and Upatissa. This is the name of the village, Kolita and Upatissa. So in these two villages, there were two Brahmin family. These two family they were very really close for seven generation, but they live in, in different villages, but in the same kingdom. So in Kolita village, there was a Brahmin woman named Rupa Sali. Rupa Sali was her name. And there was a Brahmin woman named Mokali. Okay, don't worry about the name. So Mokali and Rupa Sali, a Brahmin woman, they were close. Okay. They gave, they got pregnant the same day, and ten months later they gave birth on the same day. So Rupa Sali gave birth to the newborn baby. Uh, that baby is Upatissa, and Kolita is the name of uh, the son of Mokali. Okay, in this Kolita village. So anyway. Uh, this family were very close. They born rich, okay? good family, Brahmin family, educated. 
And wherever these two young boys go, they, they went with 500 followers. Two of them, let, let's say 1,000. Wherever they go, they go play, they go fishing, they go swimming, they go with 500, you know, uh, servants. And one day, they went to the show. There was some sort of uh, festival, hilltop festival, where people go and entertain, you know, watching the show. So they got the ticket, they got the seat, they sit in the front row, the best seat, with their friend, 500 friends, another 500 friends, so all together, 1,000 friends sit there watching the show. Uh, on the first day, they laugh when it was funny, they cry when it was sad, they get excited when the show was very excited. On the second day, this, those level of enjoyment feel to drop. And on the third day, it was completely gone from their mind. They feel that this show was very hollow. It's a hollow show. I, I see no entertaining here. When the, the show was funny, cannot laugh. When the show was sad, cannot cry. When the show was excited, have no excitement. In the mind of Upatissa, he felt like it's such a waste of time watching these people make fun in front of me, keep me laughing, make me cry, because eventually all of them are going to die anyway, including myself, sitting here and laugh and cry with them, emotionally with them. And he shared his feeling with his friend, Kolita, Upadisa and Kolita. Kolita said, you know what, I feel the same way. I'm, I'm no longer enjoy watching this show. So friends, let's do this. Why don't we seek permission from our parents and go find the wisdom. What would be the purpose of our life as we born as a human being? What would be the best life to live? So by reflecting on the show that they're watching and they stop those same desire to continue watching the show and they no longer enjoy the show and they feel like there should be something else besides sitting here and, and watching this show is such a waste of time. This is called right view. You see the root cause of what caused you unhappy, what caused you suffering. Watching the show may be the cause for many people to be happy. You pay for expensive ticket to sit on the best seat to entertain yourself because you think this can bring you happiness. It doesn't matter how much that it costs, you pay for it. This is the cause of happiness in your view. But for them, now they see that this is not the cause of happiness as I'm looking for. It is the cause of suffering. Ordinary people see pleasurable in something painful, see permanent in something impermanent. That's ordinary people just like us. See happiness in suffering. That's why we cling for things, we crave for things. And this is this, this life is run by craving or tanha. But for wis people who have a lot of wisdom, they see opposite. They see painful, impressurable thing. They see impermanent in something that impermanent. They say things the way they are, which most of us, we don't see things like that. After that point, they leave home and travel throughout India, look for a teacher, one teacher at a time and seek for knowledge. Teach me. I empty my class. Teach me about life. Teach me how to live good life. What is the deadless? How can we free ourselves from this thing? So there, these two young Brahmins happen to be very smart, you know, group of people. And not just two of them. If you study Buddhist text, you will be surprised that there were many people like this two guys, two gentlemen, that travel throughout India. They only stop during the rainy season for 90 days, and after that they start travel again. Until the next rain retreat comes, they stop. And wherever they go, they look for teacher, they ask questions, and whenever they stop, they share what they have learned. They accumulate the accumulation of their knowledge. They share with the local villager wherever they stop. This is what I know about five precepts. So come down, sit down, I share with you about the five precepts, for example. This is how I learned how to do walking meditation. Sit down, I teach you how to do walking meditation, just, just for example. 
And then they keep on traveling and find another teacher. Move on, find another teacher. Happened this to this young um, Brahmin as well. So they travel across India until they come back to their kingdom again in Rajakrit. They didn't find the answer that satisfied. And these two friends, they said, you know what, we will stay here. And if one of us, whoever find the deadless teaching, the wisdom about deadless, the wisdom about life first, please come back and share with each other. If you find it first, come back and share with me. If I find this teaching first, I will go find you for the first person. That's the agreement. So they stay there. And that happened to be the first rain retreat of the Buddha. It just, was just over. The Buddha came and gave the teaching right, to those five aesthetics. So they stay one rain retreat together. And at the end of that rain retreat, the Buddha already have accumulated 60 arahan, the monk who understand the teaching of the Buddha and have realized to the same level of knowledge, which is achieved the enlightenment, full enlightenment. 60 of them plus one, the Buddha himself. So all together, 61. And the Buddha gave that teaching that I shared with you the other day ago. Not two of you allowed to go to the same direction. You must separate and go to different direction throughout India to teach people to live good life, to find the true peace and happiness in your mind. And one of these five aesthetics, his name was Asachi, went arms round to the area where Upatisa and Kolita stay. So he went arms round early in the morning. Keep in mind that he just achieved Arahant. He ordained by the Buddha three months and he went arms round to that village. So he was walking in a very nice peaceful and calm looking manner that Upatisa never noticed any aesthetic in his whole life that he had seen to have such a peaceful looking, very mindful walking, very concentrated, very just peaceful looking, just by looking at him walking arms round. And that got his attention. You know what? This monk is somebody. Maybe he know the answer of what I have been looking for. So he secretly walked after the monk Asachi and observed, investigate the manner and how the monk Asachi received the arms round from one house to another. Until he finished his arms round, he came back and he sat down and started having his meal. So Upatisa waited until he finished the breakfast. See, this is people, a person who have manner. He can t teach himself what to do, when to do, and how to do it properly. Not just all of a sudden rush into the monk and ask the question and demand the answer. That's not nice manner. So he was waiting until the right time, wait for the monk, finish the meal and, you know, uh, having water. And then he would uh, come closer to the monk and bow and pay respect to the monk as a she, and then start conversation. For example, uh, this day we may call Venerable, what is your name? Who is your teacher? What did your teacher teach you? Would you please share with me the wisdom that you learned from your teacher? Beautiful conversation. And Mang Asachi, even though he has realized Arahan, <laughs> the highest level of enlightenment, he was very humble, super humble monk. He replied to Upatisa, Young man, I just ordained. I don't know much about the Dhamma. So I don't know what to teach you. I don't know what to share with you. And Upatisa insists, please, whatever it is, just one sentence, two sentence, doesn't matter. Please say something, what you have learned from your teacher. And Venerable Asachi know that this person, very smart, he said, I don't know much about the Dhamma. The Buddha, my teacher, teach me something which is to me, I feel, it's, I feel it's very profound, very difficult. And you know what Upatisa said? He said, Venerable, understanding part is my job. Please share with me whatever your teacher teach you. Whether I understand or not, it's basically it's none, your, none of your business, it's my problem. Please share with me. Then Venerable Asashi know it's time for him to share this teaching. 
which is the teaching of p a t i j a s a m u p a b a d a in two sentences. Amazing teaching. He said, "Thing that happening from cause." The Tathagata or my teacher talk about the cause and its cessation, and this is the teaching of my teacher. Two sentences. That's it. Period. And u p a t i s a happen to understand fully of this these two sentences, and right then he realized s o d a p a t a n a He become the stream enter or the stream winning. Right then, just by Reflecting on that teaching and fully understood it right away. You may be wondering, how can it possible for a man who listened to one sentence or two sentences and got himself enlightenment? So you have to think deeper. You don't know. Let's say when you plant the tree right into the ground today, you may notice that nothing show up. It's still becoming the seed. But a few weeks, you start seeing something show up from the ground, maybe five meters, ten meters. You don't know the development around in, underneath the ground. You don't know how much of the development, how much progress of this little seed that you plant underneath the ground. You don't see it. And you may you may be planting a few type of tree right on the same day, but when you come back, some tree grow very fast, some tree. Go very slow. You don't see the different. You you don't see the 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 development underneath the ground of each tree. Same thing with all of us. We accumulate wisdom in a different level. Up to that moment, the moment that your mind is ready, and the teacher is ready, and the right teaching is ready to be given to you. And when that thing in place, you will realize the truth by yourself, because. You have been preparing that wisdom for a very long, long time. That means your mind is concentrated, your mind is clear, is pure, and is bright with the good quality. What is the good quality of the mind again? That we learn, the mind is soft, the pure, bright, malleable, and workable, and imperturbable mind. This is the good condition of the mind that ready for the higher knowledge, which u p a t i s a have been developing that. Then he is ready. Yes. Rajan, uh, who was the person following the monk? Was it u p a t i s a or Upat, was u p a t i s a the monk? So I got. Up, Asachi. u p a t i s a was he the person who were following the monk? Yes. And who was the monk? Asachi. Asachi. Yeah, Venerable Asachi. Venerable Asachi is one of the five ascetic. Okay, the first monk who achieved enlightenment, his name was k o n t a n y a right? And ya go tanya, the Brahmin who give prediction to the newborn baby that this newborn baby will become the spiritual leader of the world. Just one option, and then he got himself ordained and stay in the wood waiting for this boy to ordain. So he gather another four Brahmin. Asachi is one of this team, happened to be one of the Arahant. So Asachi went arm round and Upatisa found him. So Asachi gave this teaching to Upatisa. And right then, he achieved the Ara. I'm sorry, the Soda Patana or the Stream Winner. He was so excited about finding this truth, understanding the truth that he has been looking for. Was so happy. So the first thing, the first person he think of was his friends Golita. So he locate them. He he locate him. He find him, and he share him what he found. You know what I found. The deadless doctrine from Venerable Asachi. Now I want to share with you. So he bring the k o l i t a to meet with Venerable Asachi and learn the same thing and attain the same thing. Both of them happen to be very smart. And later on, Venerable Asachi introduced him both of them to see the real teacher, which is my teacher. So he made arrangement, and these two uh, young Brahmin come to. The Buddha, where the Buddha stay, and as the Buddha noticed those two Brahmin walking into his premise, his temple, the Buddha was giving the teaching to the monk over there, and he he cast his eye and he noticed that these two Brahmin is coming, and he mentioned these two name to the student in front of him that you know what now 
my two great foremost disciples are arriving. Without talking to them, the Buddha mentioned that now my two great disciples has arrived. To keep the story short, they got themselves ordained under the teaching of the Buddha directly. Seven days after their ordination, Mokkalana or Golita achieved enlightenment, full enlightenment, become Arahant. And Saliputta or Upatissa happened to be smart, smarter than Golita, but attained enlightenment later, another seven days later. It took him two weeks. And why is that? Why smart people take longer? Because Sariputta, he reflects deeply on every single step of his meditation journey. Okay, what, what, where is my mind now? What level of this concentration? What happening? Observe fully. What is the first jhana? Is this the second jhana? And what's the difference between the first and the second jhana? And then move on to the third jhana and reflect on the second and the first jhana and move on to the fourth jhana and come back, come back, come back and go to the fifth, the sixth, the seventh, the eighth jhana and what's beyond the eighth jhana. So he reflects on every single step all the way up until his mind is fully pure from defilement and that is why it took him two weeks. So he knows every single step and that's, that's why when he teach, the way he teach, whoever meets Sariputta, whoever, the text says, whoever meets Sariputta, he will make sure that you, 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 attain at least Soda Patana or the stream entry. And once you achieve the stream entry, he will point you to Mokhalana. Mokhalana will take the second step to teach you and guide you to realize the full enlightenment to become Arahant. And that's how both of them support each other. That's why Saliputta has many students. When you come to him, you will find peace of mind. You will be happy. And that happiness will be a sustainable happiness because you achieve the first level of higher wisdom. So that patana or the stream, stream, the stream entry. And both of them, from that moment on, okay, Sariputta become the foremost in wisdom. Basically, he is second to the Buddha in terms of wisdom, in terms of teaching the Dhamma. If the Buddha says something, maybe one or two sentences, it's Sariputta's job to give more explanation to the monk who still don't understand what the Buddha means. And that's his job. He makes something difficult, digest it and make it easier for the student. Mokhalana was the foremost, foremost in terms of psychic power. He has ability to do all kind of supernatural power that normal human, human being cannot do. He can fly, he can go to heaven, visit the angel, he can go to hell and see the hell animal, and he can go to the Naka and talk to the Naka. So he can do a lot of things. So they served the Buddha 44 years. They die one year before the Buddha. That means the Buddha can rely on both of them because the Buddha needs these two uh, uh, disciples to manage the Sangha. So the Buddha can free his time to do something else. This is how they support each other. So these two great monks support the Buddha for 44 years before they die. And the, the many beautiful story about Sariputta, even on his deathbed. Okay, so I may share with you tomorrow for the second half. Um, <clears throat> Sariputta pay high respect to Venerable Asachi every single day before he go to bed he would locate his master, his teacher, in his meditation. And if he know that his teacher stay in that direction, in that town, and over there, he will make sure that he bow to that direction before he go to bed. Because without Venerable Asashi, he will not be able to meet the teacher. He will not be able to be where he is at at the moment. You see how humble he is, how respectful he is towards his teacher, toward the teaching of the Buddha. If someone gives you the wisdom, or if someone guide you, point you to the wisdom for you to live good life, I think you owe that person big time. And it's difficult to pay them back. Not paying with the money, it's, it's difficult to pay. How can you pay back your parents? We don't know, right? How much money 
that they deserve by, by taking good care of us, raise us, teach us to be a good person. We cannot put the price on this. You cannot put the price on your teacher. You cannot put the price on the teaching. But what you can do is to live life as a good example, to respect your teacher and respect the teaching. And that's what Venerable Sariputta lived his life and live his life as a good example, okay? And when I come to his last teaching, the moment that he about to die, and I, you know, honestly, to be honest with you, <laughs> I was crying on the spot, in front of the book, very touching, super, super touching. Maybe I'll share with you tomorrow. <laughs> okay, and that's particular sutra, very beautiful, very beautiful. What we have learned here is about developing the right view. How you see the world and that's how you're going to live your life. So if you don't know how to develop the right view, most likely you will fall into the wrong view. And how can we develop the right view? Starting from associating with good people, associating with the right teaching, hang out with the right crowd, read the right books, if you continue reading the sutra, you will be brainwashed with the new input, with the wisdom from the Buddha. And when we brainwash with the right teaching, okay, we clean out all the garbage, all the wrong will, wrong thinking, wrong attitude, and input the new input into your information bank in your head. Then you reflect on it. And that's the starting point of having good life by developing the good will to see things the way they are. Okay, so in short, good will is about seeing the root cause of happiness and seeing the root cause of suffering. Fully understand it, and when you see things the way they are, you will most likely following the good path, right? The path that leads you to live good life. And that is the right view, okay? For, uh, 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 just to keep it simple, this is the right view. But in fact, right view, the Buddha means deeper than this. So it's your job to go study and find ways to relate it to it. If I start talking about life after death, I'm talking about the law of karma, I'm talking about a, the Four Noble Truth, it's going to be hard for many of us to be able to relate it to it and put it into practice. And then right view becomes a confusing topic. So just keep it simple. All right? So any reflection, any question so far? before we meditate.